Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much for this invitation. It has been so long that I've been at a conference and now this is a possibility to say the things that I really want to say. This will be a kind of a survey talk. So I don't want to talk so much about proofs and maybe not even so much about precise statements of everything, but more about the, the big picture and, and how I see it. So I first want to tell you about um, period numbers, what they are, how they can be defined. And then turn to the, the period conjecture and then finally speculate a bit on, on the connection. So that's the all minimality part of, of the title. So let's talk about periods. Periods are, are numbers that you can write as values of integrals. So you're integrating omega over delta, where both omega and delta are of some kind of algebraic or arithmetic um, nature. I'll be more precise, la precise later. If you don't put any conditions, of course, you can write any complex number like this, but uh, we are putting conditions. There are several equivalent definitions around, and with several, I mean like a dozen. Some of them are just variant, slight variations of things, but then there are also really big diff different types of definitions of what a period number um, could, could be. They appear in many um, different um, settings. So one settings where they, setting where they appear is in um, quantum field theory is Feynman integrals. So this explains the interest of um, people with a background in mathematical um, physics. So this talk won't mention mathematical physics um, at all. That's not where, where I come from, but it explains the interests of, of other people. Let's do examples first. The very first example that everyone knows is uh, Cauchy's integral. We're integrating dz over z, um, viewed as a, so z is a complex um, variable here, and I'm integrating over the unit circle. And then of course the answer is um, two pi i. So two pi i is the first example of a period number. You can keep the same differential dz over z, but integrate not around a closed loop, but uh, along some, some path from one to, to alpha. And then the answer is log alpha. Maybe traditionally you would say alpha is a positive real number, and then this is just the ordinary logarithm. So log values of logarithms in algebraic points would be periods as well. Another old example is the, the case of Euler integrals. So the, here, the differential form is of dx, dx over y, where y is the square root of some polynomial of um, degree um, three. And I want this polynomial of degree three to have coefficients in the algebraic numbers. So for example, x times x minus one times x minus lambda. And as a path of integration, taking a straight path from, from zero um, to one. So Euler was studying these things. Because a much better way to look at the same integral is to say we are on an elliptic curve. Uh, this is an elliptic curve. And then dx over y is the invariant um, differential on the elliptic curve. And this pass from, from zero to one, it lifts to the elliptic curve. And uh, you work it out, it goes around half. It's not a loop, it's only half of a loop. But then if you go back the other way along the other branch, then it, you get a closed loop and the, the value of the integral will double. So basically this Euler integral is, the, is a period of, a, of an elliptic curve. Uh, and that's where the whole story gets its name. So when you're integrating um, forms in the plane and then you get periodicities and the periods, they, they are the periods. There are also higher dimensional examples of differential form dx wedge dy over one minus x times y. And delta is a triangle. So like, like this, I, I hope. X is less than y, yes. So it's the area um, under, under the triangle. And the value of this integral is zeta of two, classical identity. The same trick also works for um, all natural numbers. If you evaluate this particular integral over the 
simplex in, in, high, in higher dimensions, then you get um, zeta of n. So values of the Riemann zeta function. And I hope that you all agree that these are all really interesting numbers. Periods are a really rich source of interesting numbers. Of course, there are many more non-periods than periods, but the non-periods usually are, are boring. They're just something. But these numbers that you write down in a special way coming from, from arithmetic data, they are interesting. So let me come to a, a proper definition. And I'm calling this the elementary definition, depending on where you come from you would think that this is a difficult definition or an elementary one. So this is the notion um, of, a, of a naive period. So a naive period, naive period is a complex number of the form integral omega over domain of integration G, where G is contained in R to the N. It's compact, there's some orientation because we want to integrate as dimension D, but the really important condition on G is that it's, it's a semi-algebraic subset of R to the N and it's Q semi-algebraic. So this means this subset is defined by polynomial equations with coefficients in the rationals. And you're also allowed to use um, the lesser equal sign in your definition. So that's um, semi-algebraic. So all the integrals that I gave, they were was written down with semi-algebraic sets. And omega is um, algebraic. You can even take omega as a rational um, differential form with Q bar coefficients, regular on G. So there's no problem with convergence of anything, degree D, it's closed. So the important condition for, for omega, oops, no, I want this one. It's a, it's an, it's a, it's an algebraic differential form defined over Q bar. Suppose omega and G have these um, algebraicity properties. This definition, this precise version of the definition was written down by, by Friedrich. Um, this version of the definition shows up uh, in traditional transcendence theory. So going back to people like, like Lindemann and, and Schneider, Baker, um, of course, they didn't have the notion of a period or this definition, but these were the numbers, um, the type of numbers that we are looking at. It's very similar to a definition that you can find in a very influential paper by Konsevich and Zagier on, on period numbers. It's not precisely taken from there, but very similar in spirit and in fact equivalent to, to their definition. So let me give another example of a naive period. When you take a semi-algebraic subset of, of R to the N of full dimension, an n-dimensional semi-algebraic subset of um, dimension N, and then as differential form, the, the volume form, dt1 wedge dt2 up to wedge dtn. So t1 up to tn are the variables um, on Rn. And then you integrate, of course, what you get is the volume. So volumes of semi-algebraic sets, they are prototypes um, of, of naive periods. This looks a bit special, but in fact, it's not special. In fact, in fact um, a complex number is a naive period if and only if both the, well, volumes are as close to periods as they can possibly be. If you have a volume, you always get a real number and it's always positive. So if you, if you look at complex numbers whose real and imaginary part are up to science volumes, that's the best you can hope for. Um, and that's actually what's, what's true. So yeah, this is the, the theorem. You get a comparison result like this. So why, why should this be true? Well, integration, if you're integrating a function, that's the volume under the graph, right? That's the key part of the argument, and then you have to work. So this was pretty elementary, I think. I had this notion of a semi-algebraic set in there, which I didn't really define. There's a completely different approach uh, via um, cohomology. 
notion of a cohomological period. So for this approach, I'm, I'm fixing an embedding of Q bar into the complex numbers. Um, to be honest, I did this before. When I was doing these integrals, I was also fixing an embedding of Q bar into the complex numbers. And we are using algebraic varieties over Q bar. So X is an algebraic variety of a Q bar and Y is a closed subvariety. And when I say cohomology or homology, then what I'm thinking of is singular homology. So I'm looking at singular homology of the pair X, Y, and elements in there are represented by chains. So by Q linear combinations of simplices and, uh, and a singular simplex by definition is a map from the standard simplex standard i-dimensional simplex like triangles into um, the analytic space defined by the algebraic variety. So every, when you have a set of polynomial equation, it gives us a complex manifold or complex analytic space. And you can ask this map um, sigma j to be continuous, or you can ask it to be um, C infinity, you get the same theory. And the y comes in by the boundary condition. So these are maps to, to X or the analytic space defined by X and the, the boundary of this um, chain is supported on Y. So that's relative homology. There's a second cohomology theory that comes into play. That's um, Durham cohomology. Durham cohomology was introduced, algebraic Durham cohomology was introduced by Grotendieck. It's defined in the smooth case, it's defined as the as hypercohomology of the complex of algebraic um, differential forms. So the nice thing about Ram cohomology is that it's defined in purely um, algebraic terms. It only uses the algebraic variety. Singular homology is defined using analysis and topology of the analytic space, but now the Ram cohomology is completely um, algebraic. So in particular, these Durham cohomology groups, if the variety is defined over K, then the Durham cohomology will give you um, K vector spaces. I'm working over Q bar, so these will be Q bar vector spaces. And then Durham cohomology and then singular homology are linked via the period pairing. So every class in Durham cohomology is represented by some differential form and every singular homology class is represented by some, some cycle. And then we can integrate. If you want to do this really precisely, I think it's customary just to, just to write integral sigma omega, integrate a differential form over a singular chain. And what this means is you pull back the differential form to the standard simplex, and then you integrate on the standard simplex. This is the pairing. And what Grotendieck showed is that this pairing is well-defined. So you have different, um, different uh, differential forms giving rise to the same cohomology class. You have um, different um, chains giving rise to the same homology class. But by Stokes theorem, this is well defined. And that's the more important part of the statement. Um, it's a perfect pairing. If you rewrite this from a pairing into a duality, you can also see this as an isomorphism between Durham cohomology and singular cohomology. So the dual. The dual of um, homology is cohomology, and having a pairing is the same as having a map to the dual. And then this becomes an isomorphism after extending scalars to the complex numbers. Now we have the period pairing, and it even induces this period isomorphism. But now we have the same vector space of the complex numbers, and it has a Q structure coming from singular homology and a Q bar structure coming from Durham cohomology. And they interact in a non-trivial way. So the definition is a cohomological period is a complex number that you get in the image of this period pairing. 
for varying varieties X and sub varieties Y, and um, also you, the, the index I, the, the cohomological degree um, is allowed to vary. So you get a set of cohomological periods. This definition really goes back to, to Grotendieck, but then it was Yves André to, who really worked it out and explained it to everyone. And you also find the same point of view in papers of, of Delinia and, and Konsevich and, and many other people. So now I've given you two very different definitions. Well, they're not so different. In both cases, you're integrating differential forms or something coming from differential forms um, over something algebraic. Sarah so pointed out um, that these are the same numbers. Well, he did this in the case of elliptic curves and elliptic integrals. So in this very in the very first paper when Grotendieck defined algebraic Durham cohomology and he defined the period isomorphism. Um, he also had these, these numbers coming up in the, in the period matrix um, of cohomology of elliptic curves. And then by, the, it's a remark in, in Grotendieck's paper, Sarah told him that these are the same numbers that people in transcendence pe theory are looking at, these are um, elliptic periods. And this really extends to the full picture. So these two sets of period numbers are the same. You can pick your favorite um, definition and you always get the same, um, the same um, set of complex numbers. It's not only a set, it's a Q-bar algebra, if you think a little bit about it. You get the same Q-bar algebra of um, period numbers. So I don't really want to talk about proofs, but I can at least give you a hint. So the, the main ingredient into the proof is the existence of semi-algebraic and triangulations. When you have a semi-algebraic set and every algebra, the, the complex analytic space attached to an algebraic variety that can be viewed as a semi-algebraic set. So every semi-algebraic set has a triangulation, so a decomposition into simplices, and all these simplices are also um, semi-algebraic. And then you can use the triangulation to describe um, homology. And you can also, if you have a semi-algebraic um, G, in the first definition, yeah, there was a semi-algebraic set G. So you do decompose this into simplices, and then these simplices give you a chain in homology. So you get from semi-algebraic sets to homology classes, and you can also go the other way. Every homology class can be described via any triangulation. And then you have a description via semi-algebraic sets. So this is the main ingredient. It's a statement um, from um, semi-algebraic geometry. But even after this main idea, um, th there are lots of technical problems. So one technical problem is that, yeah, you really want to reduce to the affine case. And this uses um, Norris um, basic lemma, if you've heard about this. And then also you need to reduce to the smooth case because this nice connection between algebraic varieties and differential forms that only holds in the smooth case. I was cheating you. <laughs> I gave you the definition of algebraic Durham cohomology in the smooth case. But then you, when I wrote X and Y, there was no condition whatsoever. X and Y can have singularities that don't need to have to be proper or anything. So I really want to have all X and all Y there is a definition of Durham cohomology in this general case. And, um, but if you want to do the comparison, then, this, then you have to reduce to the smooth case. So this relies on the argument of appearing in a paper of Belkada and Brosnan. So it goes on for quite a number of pages to get on this comparison done. So actually I've given you three characterization of periods now. One via semi-algebraic geometry, then the one that went even more to the elementary side, just volumes of um, semi-algebraic set, uh, sets. And then on the other hand, um, the, the characterization via cohomology. They form a countable subset of the complex numbers. So you can see this either via the volume description or via the cohomological description. In both cases, there's only a countable amount of data and then the numbers in the image, that's only only a countable set. Okay, so this was about, yeah, this was about um, definitions. So, so maybe now would be a good point if you have um, questions so far. Now, 
smoke. Okay. So let's talk about the period conjecture a bit. So this is really the question. Now we have all these, these interesting numbers, these period numbers. Question is, what are the relations um, between them? So that's really a question of transcendence theory. For a complex number to be transcendental means to be algebraically independent of one or linearly independent of, you bar linearly independent of one. So there are these different points of view, but tra yeah, transcendence theory, uh, first asking whether a number is transcendental and then later on asking what are the relations between these numbers. Uh, this, this really is, is transcendence theory. So you want to talk about a bit about the, the history of this question. And it really goes back a long time, all the way back to, to Lindemann in 1882 in Freiburg <laughs> proved um, transcendence of pi. He also proved transcendence of numbers like log two, or more generally log of, of alpha when alpha is, is algebraic. And then the next big step was in 1934, when Gelfond and Schneider proved, for example, that log two and log three are cuba linearly independent independently. So it was two, two proofs coming in the same at the same time. So more generally, log alpha and log beta are cuba linearly independent if alpha and beta are um, algebraic numbers that are not in a multiplicative relation. So if you look at log of alpha and log of alpha squared, then there is a relation, but that's the only type of relation that, that you can have. Siegel started the transcendence theory of, um, of elliptic periods. And then really this was fully developed by, by, by Schneider asking about um, relations between, linear relations between elliptic periods. And then the really big theorem of Baker in 1966, who was considering a whole space of values of log. So I've not, one or two values of the log function, but a whole bunch of them. And then you determine what, what the rank is. Okay, I don't want to formulate this precisely. And, and this goes on and on. And I'm probably not the best person to tell you about um, results in um, transcendence theory. So <laughs> let me stop here. The big conjecture, period conjecture says that the, the only relations between period numbers in any of the senses that I described are the obvious relations. This raises the question what the obvious relations are, but it's really meant to be obvious, obvious as in as obvious as it can be. So in the case of log, yeah, I told you log alpha and log of alpha square, there is a relation, it's that kind of obvious. The first formulation of this conjecture is, uh, is due to Grotendieck, but he didn't really publish it. So there was a hint in this, this um, Durham cohomology paper, but then the one who formulated it for, for us was, um, was Yves André, and you also find it in the work of, of Deligne. So this version of the conjecture is based on, on algebraic geometry and relations that come from, from algebraic cycles and more generally um, motives. So the category of pure motives, this was the first case that we're thinking of. Category of pure motives is fully described in terms of um, um, algebraic um, cycles. And then whenever you have a, a map between motives, then these motives have periods, again, the same period numbers, and then all kinds of functoriality between motives. You can formulate this as a statement on functoriality of motives, or you can formulate it as a statement on every, every map on a homology induced um, by algebraic cycles. Um, this is the, the kind of obvious relations they were thinking of. And then if you replace pure motives by mixed motives, that's like the Gutendieck um, formulation of the period conjecture. The only relations between motives are the ones coming um, between the, the only relations between period numbers are the ones coming from functoriality for, for motives. 
And if you specialize to one motif or one algebraic variety, if you would like, um, then you get a fine, finally generated um, algebra of periods of that particular variety. And this point of view gives you a formula for the transcendence degree of that, um, of that algebra. So the prediction is that the transcendence degree should be equal to the dimension of the motivic algebra. So that, that's one point of view. It uses relies on cohomology and on, on motives. But then Konsevich formulated a version of the, the period um, conjecture that a priori has a very different um, flavor. This point of view was really developed by, by Nori. There's, there's work of Ayub, who actually proved it in the function field case, and is also spelled out in, in my book with Stefan Müller Stach. So this version of the period conjecture has more a calculus um, flavor. If you think of the definition of periods as um, integrals of some over semi-algebraic sets, then the obvious relations are the ones coming from the, from the transformation formula. That gives you a formula relation between, um, when you have a map between semi-algebraic sets and you pull back the differential form. So you get a the transformation formula gives you a relation between period numbers. And the other type of um, relation that you get is from Stokes theorem whether you integrate um, d omega over some domain or um, omega over the boundary it gives you the same period number. This point of view um, involves a formula for um, the Q bar dimension of the space of periods attached to some, I don't want to say motive, but it's motive. So if you look at the Q bar um, dimension of the space of um, periods um, generated by HI of some algebraic variety, that's a finite dimensional um, space and the conservative version of the period conjecture makes a prediction for the dimension of this um, space. But again, these two versions, these two point of view um, are essentially equivalent. There's a very small difference that you don't have to worry about if you don't know the details and then you would know it anyway. So the Konsevich point of view and the Grudendieck point of view uh, for, the, for the period conjecture, they, they are equivalent. You can think of motives or you can think of um, transformation rules for integrals on, of semi-algebraic sets. And, and this gives you the same type of obvious um, relations. So I'm attributing this theorem to, to Nori because really the way to prove this is to, to introduce a theory of um, motives. That's what he did. He, he developed a theory of mixed motives. And then using this theory of mixed motive, motives, um, the, the Grotendieck version in terms of motives is equivalent to the explicit one um, written down um, by, by Konsevich. So I've been using the word motive a lot. So let, let, let me say a few more words about this. When I'm, a category of motives is always an abelian category. So it's a category where you can compute. You have exact sequences, you can take kernels and co-kernels, you can compute. And it should be, and it's an abelian category such that um, cohomology factors. So we have, um, we have algebraic geometry, we have the category of algebraic varieties. And we have um, Q vector spaces. And then we have cohomology. So this could be a singular cohomology or the RAM cohomology, cohomology series. And category of mixed motive sits um, in between. So it has the has the flavor of a category of Q vector spaces in being a billion so that you can compute. It's something linear. But it's still as close to algebraic geometry as it can be. Uh, that's the category of motives. So in the category of mixed motives, you have all the morphisms coming from algebraic geometry. Whenever there's a morphism between algebraic varieties or between pairs of algebraic varieties, then there's also a morphism in the category of um, mixed motives. That's what this functor from algebraic varieties to mixed motives says. And you have long exact sequences. Whenever you expect a long exact sequence in cohomology, that all really comes from a long exact sequence um, in the category of, of motives. And mixed motives are universal. 
with this property. So as close to, to algebraic geometry as um, they, they can be. And contrary to rumors, um, this theory exists. There is a well-defined category of um, mixed motives defined by Bainori that has all these properties and that can be used to give a precise formulation um, of, of the period um, conjecture. And then you can use this in a Gutendick style formulation of the conjecture where you talk about factoriality of motives, or you can use it to translate to, to the conceivage version. Okay, it's a big conjecture. Yeah, going back to, to Gordendick. Um, what's the evidence? Because we have all the classical results from transcendence theory. So all the I, I gave you these examples that these classical numbers like log of two and two pi i, they are elliptic periods, they're all examples um, of period numbers. And all the transcendence results from classical um, transcendence theory can be read as confirmation of the period um, conjecture. The conceived version of the period conjecture um, holds for um, periods coming from algebraic curves. So that's the one dimensional case, or if you like, it's a period, the period conjecture for one motives holds. This was um, worked out by Gisbert Wistols and myself. And the really big input into this is um, the, the analytic subgroup theorem of Gisbert um, proved um, quite a while ago. Yeah, so you have to be careful. I'm not saying that the, the period conjecture holds for curves or periods of curves or periods of one motives. So this is the conceived relation. It makes a prediction about the Q bar vector space. It's not a prediction, it's a theorem. Uh, for the Q bar um, relations between um, periods um, in degree one, one dimensional integrals. And all the, the relations that we get are precisely the ones coming from um, algebraic geometry. Yeah, this is different from the Grotendieck version of the period conjecture for one motives, where you would look at the algebra generated by these numbers and make a prediction of the transcendence degree. So we, ha we haven't said anything about that. We say something about the cubada dimension. So the, the two conjectures are equivalent if you do them for all objects. But if you restrict to a subset, or in this, yeah, in this case, um, one dimensional objects, um, th they are two different um, statements. So the, the Grotendieck version, uh, we really don't know anything. What we know is um, CM elliptic curves. So that's not all elliptic curves or all curves. It's complex elliptic curves with complex uh, multiplication. Now this was um, established in, by Shudnovsky in 1978. Uh, he, he, he proved that the transcendence degree is at least two. And then in this case, that's um, what you expect and it gives you a sharp bound. So this is what we know about the period conjecture as I, as I stated it, or as I, as I hinted, it's really next to nothing. Uh, compared to the, the width of the problem, that's next to nothing. Generalizations have been established. So there's the independent proofs Ayub of an, Ayub and Nori uh, in the function field case. So that then all the relations between periods of this is about transcendence theory of functions now, um, the other ones can um, predicted by the period conjecture. So can also read this as, uh, as a confirmation. To give you a feeling on, on what we don't know, I told you that the values of the Riemann zeta function in, in natural numbers are periods. And this period conjecture implies that the, the values at, at odd integers should all be algebraically independent. And even integers, we have the powers of pi, so we understand that. But if you look at the odd values, they should be algebraically independent. And we really don't know this. <laughs> we know that zeta three is irrational. We don't even know that a single one of them is transcendental, let alone that they're algebraically independent. So this is, um, we have now a very nice framework to talk about these conjectures, but we don't have a lot of confirmation. We, we have the one dimensional case. Oh, that's already like good. We have a question in the chat by Dinesh Thakur. Maybe just unmute and ask away.
So maybe the mic's not working. Uh, the question was, what does essentially stand for in the Nori theorem? Um, so, Kurt-Konsevich Konsevich defines a space of formal, well, formal periods by explicit generators and relations. And then this um, space of, so basically expressions in terms of H, I, X, Y, the so cohomology, and then an omega and a sigma. And then the relations are the ones coming from boundary maps in cohomology and functoriality for, for pairs of algebraic varieties. So yes, this explicit um, algebra. And then the period conjecture says that the evaluation map from formal periods to period numbers should be injective. And the Grotendieck version would only say something about the so the, the essential part is that if you have the Grotendieck version of the period conjecture about the transcendence degree, then you also need to know that this um, space of periods is connected. So we know it's, it's smooth. From the abstract theory, it follows that it's a smooth um, space. Spec of the period algebra is smooth. It's a smooth, it's a torsor under the motivic Galois group. And if in addition this tor this um, torsor is um, um, connected, then the Grotendieck conjecture implies that also the evaluation map is injective. Yeah, sorry. So it's this connectedness. And um, I think um, some people include this in, in, in the Grotendieck conjecture, then that would be completely um, equivalent. Oh, and I didn't localize. I didn't mention that you have to um, invert the Tate motive. Yeah, never mind. But that doesn't make a difference. Let's come to the to the speculation part. There's a question that I want to raise is, is this, this relation of, of the theory of periods to semi-algebraic geometry, is this more than a curiosity? You know, we have these very different flavors of definitions of, um, of periods. All the structural insights come from this point of view of, um, of cohomology and um, description via a Tanaka group. Um, so the uh, algebraic geometry point of view is very good for, um, in a cohomological point of view, is very good to give a conceptual interpretation. But um, on the other hand, we have this completely different um, description via semi-algebraic geometry, which also has its own set of obvious um, relations. Is this just an accident or is this um, something um, important? That's really a question. And I would like to argue that maybe it's important. Maybe it's something that we should explore. So what's the evidence why we should explore this? The evidence comes in, in the shape of a generalization of the whole story. It comes via the theorem of exponential periods. So this goes also back to the same um, paper of Konsevich and Zagi. They, there they also consider exponential periods. So they are integrals, again, integ you're still integrating, but now under the integral, there's this extra factor e to the minus, um, minus f. If you put f equal to zero, then you get back ordinary um, periods, but uh, now you allow something more. And as with classical periods, there are several very different um, points of view. You can look at this from the point of view of um, cohomology. And in this case, this was really the original, um, the way they, they were introduced. Classical periods, the RAM cohomology, that's the theory of um, period isomorphism, the Riemann Hilbert correspond for regular connections. So you have a vector bundle with a connection on it. This gives rise to the Durham complex. And if this, um, this, this connection has only regular singular connections, then you're in Hodge theory and the period isomorphism. Bloch and Denot wanted to study irregular um, connections and, and go towards a Hodge theory for irregular, um, or something like Hodge theory for irregular um, connections. So this was their paper was the starting point, and then the, the theory was really developed fully in a series of papers of Heen. 
So there is a there is a homology theory that you can use instead of singular homology, and you use the RAM homology of a now an irregular connection on a uh, on a complex of um, of differential forms, and the, the differential is twisted by some exponential factor. So the, the f comes in, in in the differential of the um, of the of the RAM complex. So, and then there's again a period isomorphism. And once you have a period isomorphism, you can define periods as the elements, the numbers in the image of the period pairing. So that's the first point of view for exponential periods. There is a theory of uh, motifs underlying the whole story that was developed by um, Fresan and, and Yossen. And, and the picture that we get from the motivic point of view is really as nice as in the classical case. So there's a nice theory of motives and um, all periods coming from cohomology and also the periods coming um, from motives. And then you have a Tanaka group and, and you can do all these things. And then now in this case, the elementary point um, came last and that's in a, in a paper of um, Johan Kummelin, Philipp Habegger and, and, and myself, where we also give an elementary definition or what I call more elementary um, definition of these exponential um, periods. And as in the classical case, um, all these different points of view are actually um, equivalent. So let me let me give you a definition, proper definition of um, naive exponential periods. Yes, the definition that we came up with in this paper. So, uh, oh, and that, yeah. Uh, Rit, uh, there is a question, please. Um, by Hershey um, Kisilevsky. Will you please unmute and ask away? Okay. So he asks if zeros of zeta functions are periods. Um, zeros, uh, um, I don't know. I don't think they are. I don't think they are, but I don't know. And Andrew Obus also asked, what about the real parts of the zeros? I don't know that either. So, good question. Thank you. Yeah, good question. No, we have this definition of a naive um, exponential period, which looks very much like the definition of an exponential of a, of a naive period that I gave in the classical case. So again, we have a semi-algebraic subset of, of C to the N of um, dimension D and there's some orientation. In the classical case, we were asking G to be compact. Now it's only a closed subset. So it's not necessarily compact. Omega is as before, it's, a, it's an algebraic D form on affine space, a rational differential form. And F, F is a rational function on affine space. So again, algebraic function. And we ask it to be regular and proper. So there's a second compactness condition here. We ask F to be proper on G. And one more condition, the image if you apply this algebraic function f to g, then the image is contained in a strip. So this is the complex plane, and then f of g is contained in a strip like this. So the, the real part is bounded below, and the imaginary part is bounded. And if you have these conditions, then this e to the minus f, the real part will go to infinity and you'll get exponential decay. So this condition makes sure that you get absolute convergence. So this is a well-defined um, number. So these are the naive exponential periods and we get the same kind of comparison result. So they, yeah, these are, this gives the same set of numbers as the one coming um, from comparison of rapid decay homology with um, twisted um, Durham cohomology. So this is a good definition because it captures the information from cohomology. And as in the classical case, we find these numbers as volumes. So if a complex number is a naive exponential period, then its real and an imaginary part are up to sign as, as much as you can hope. And the volume, not of a semi-algebraic set, 
but of a definable set in a certain um, O minimal structure. So that's uh, finally where the O minimal um, O minimality of the of my title um, comes in. Um, so note in the classical case, this was an equivalence. We don't get an equivalence in this case. We just get an implication in one direction. And we do not expect an equivalence. We expect um, the left-hand side to be strictly contained in the right-hand side. Um, this is usually really hard to prove. So you, we, you would need to prove that, oh, sorry. You'd need to prove that e to the e is not a naive exponential period. And it's always next to impossible to show that something is not a period. So we, we don't know this. Nevertheless, um, there is this relation. So these naive exponential periods, they, they are volumes in this O minimal structure. O minimality comes in. Let me tell you just a little bit about um, O minimality. So what does, it what does it mean for a set to be definable in this um, structure that I can't um, pronounce? It means that the set can be written in terms of Boolean operations. So you're allowed finite unions, finite intersection, taking complements, products, that type of um, operation. You're also allowed to take images under um, projection of um, to, to coordinates. And then the interesting part, you can write down um, the basic building blocks for the definition are polynomials, again, with Q coefficients. But now in addition to semi-algebraic geometry, um, you're also allowed to use the real exponential function and you're allowed to use the sine function restricted to some compact interval. For example, sine function restricted um, to, to the interval zero, um, one. So an example of such a, such a set definable in this um, structure is the set of um, pairs of real numbers where y is at most e to the x and x squared is bigger or equal than two. So x squared bigger or equal than two, that's um, algebraic, and, um, but you're also allowed to use the exponential function in your, in your definition. So this is between minus square root of two and m square root of two. And then you have the graph of the exponential function and y has to be below, so something like this. So that's sets of this um, shape. And the big theorem is that, not our theorem, but the big theorem that we are using, uh, is that this structure where I'm allowing these operation is um, O minimal. So this means that the subsets of the real numbers that are definable, they are just finite unions of intervals. Well, and, and possibly infinite things. like Well, they, they could be, the intervals could be infinite. Yes, right. when I'm saying interfit, yeah, I'm thinking of half open intervals like this, so going off to infinity, that's, that's also allowed, yes. But only finitely many of these things. You're also allowed to use single points, that's also fine. So this is um, due to, to Wilke and um, then Van and Ries Miller, so you have to combine two big theorems. So let me comment for those people who don't know about um, or minimality. The complex exponential function is not definable in any O minimal structure. That's because um, the complex exponential function is periodic. If you take the, the pre image of, of zero, oh, wait. The image of the exponential function, what I'm, yeah, oh, okay. That, that's a stupid point here to take, just any other point. Um, then the pre-image is a, is a discrete set. E to the two pi i is, um, yeah, it's periodic. Um, and an infinite sequence of points is not definable. Subsets of the reals have to be finite, finite unions of intervals or points. So complex exponential function is, is, not, um, is not allowed. But um, if, you, if you're bounding the imaginary part, then that's fine. We have the sine function uh, on a bounded interval. So if, the, if you bound the, the imaginary part um, of, of, the, of the argument, then that's definable. 
And, and that's how you get to the things that we have in the definition of a naive period. And this definition of a naive period, I was bounding the, the, the imaginary part. That's precisely in order to make this, um, this true. So this condition on, the, on f of g was, it can be used in order to ensure um, absolute convergence, but it, it's also used in order to get this relation to this um, O minimal structure. And O minimal theory, the geometry that you get is very similar to, to semi-algebraic um, geometry. It's a very nice type um, of, um, of um, algebraic uh, of, of, of geometry, and it's a direct generalization. So another example of an O minimal structure is that the structure where you only allow polynomials, not no complicated um, holomorphic functions, um, and then you get back semi-algebraic geometry. So let, let's look a bit wider. What's the relation between O minimality and, and the period conjecture? Well, there certainly is a relation between O minimality and, and transcendence theory. So I'm, I'm viewing the Andre Ott conjecture as a higher dimensional, um, as higher dimensional transcendence theory. And there's the theorem of Pilar Wilke and a whole strategy to prove the Andre Ott conjecture that has been applied to prove or reprove the Andre Ott conjecture in, in, in some cases. So there is a relation, just roughly, there is a relation between O minimality and, and transcendence theory. There's also a relation between O minimality and, and Hodge theory. I didn't stress this so much, but of course the period isomorphism is the starting point of um, the theory of Hodge structures and the, and the Hodge conjecture. And um, so there's a very close relation between the Hodge conjecture and the period conjecture. They, to some extent, they, 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 are, they, are, they are similar. And there has been an application of minimality to Hodge theory. So consequences of the Hodge conjecture have been proved um, using minimality. These are papers by Bebaga, Brunbach, Klinger, Zimmermann in different combinations of these um, people. And now we have this um, small relation between periods of irregular connection, exponential periods, and also um, O minimality. And so, so I can just ask again, is the period conjecture really a conjecture about algebraic geometry or is it a conjecture about O minimality? Maybe we should try to use the tools of all minimality to approach the period um, conjecture. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>